You have your Bibles, look with me to the book of Job, and I want to talk to you this morning about how to respond to, last week we talked about personal suffering, and then this week we're going to talk about how do I respond to people's suffering. And I think you're in one of those two categories. You're either personally going through some level of hardship, or you are been through it and you're on the mountain. You're either in the valley or on the mountain. And, uh, and so this, uh, this message, we're talking to those perhaps that uh, have, have gone through it and you're on the mountain and you've survived and you're wanting to help somebody else that's going through difficulty. I think the book of Job kind of answers that question. Uh, it shows us uh, a tragic ev- events that happened to a man's life and how he responded. We talked about that last week. But then it also shows us uh, this side of uh, the story, and that is, is how do I respond to someone who is going through some personal suffering in their life? Maybe you've heard the story about the unsympathetic wife, that a woman took her husband to the doctor's office, and after his checkup, the doctor said, your husband is suffering from a very serious infection. And the husband, who was hard of hearing, said, what did he say? His wife said, he says you're sick. The doctor went on, but there's hope. You just need to reduce his stress. Each morning, give him a healthy breakfast. Be pleasant, nice, and kind. For lunch and dinner, make him his favorite meal. Don't discuss any problems with him. It will only make his stress worse. Don't yell at him or argue with him. And most importantly, just cater to your husband's every whim. If you can do this for your husband for the next six months to a year, I think your husband will have a complete recovery. The husband said, What did he say? His wife said, He says you're going to die. (laughs) We're going to look this morning on how to respond to other people's suffering. And we're going to look at Job's three slash four friends and how they responded to Job's suffering. I don't have to remind you of the difficulty that Job went through. The great and severe loss that he had. That, that losing his, his business, his farm, losing his servants, losing his, his ten kids. And then also experiencing health issues, boils. He went through some great suffering. Last week, we looked at a model of faith how we go through trials and what were, what were some of the things that he went did that was a wonderful example of going through personal suffering. And in that, in that, in sense, we looked at three things. One, that he worshiped God despite great suffering and sorrow. He trusted God despite great loss. And then he didn't blame God despite the evil that happened. Those were three keys or three models of, of faith of somebody going through some personal suffering. Well, we're looking at the flip side today. Those that are outside that are looking in at Job and his suffering and his great loss and uh, looking at the suffering that he, he's gone through. And so now all of a sudden the story comes where we have the arrival of Job's three friends, the three amigos, I would guess, And uh, there are appropriate responses to people in the midst of their suffering, and there is not appropriate responses. These guys did both. The first week that they were with Job, they had a great example, a model example of how to help somebody going through personal suffering. But then we see later on, how they had a horrible response to suffering. And so today we're going to look at what is the appropriate response 
to somebody going through personal suffering, how can I be a good friend on a, to somebody who's having a bad day? Being a good friend to somebody who is having a bad day. We're going to answer that question this morning. And we're going to look at Job chapter 2 and verse number 11 through 13. I know you stood for a while, but just in honor of God's word, let's stand as we read three verses today. Job chapter 2, verse number 11 through 13. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days Seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Father, we ask your blessing upon the ministry of your word. Give us ears to hear. May the Spirit help us to be receptive, and may I minister as you would see fit today. And we pray, Father, these, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be reseated. How can I be supportive to someone in an overwhelming situation? How can I be a good friend to someone going through personal struggle? This morning, I want to share with you three things that you can do to be a support to someone as they're going through a personal tragedy in life. In light of what's happened in our Clinton Central community, I think this is really a skill that is needed uh, in people's lives today. In fact, I want to share with you three points. I'm going to give them to you right here up front. And that is, number one is be near. Number two is shed a tear. And then number three is just hear. And so I believe that if you do these three things, that this will help you to respond to other people's suffering and be a source of encouragement to them. Let's look at the first point, number one, and that is to be near. If you look in verse number 11, it's so strange for you not to have it up here on these these boards, but if you look at verse number 11 of Job chapter 2, the scripture reads this, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, Each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come. Did you hear that? Two words there. They had, each one came from his own place. Verse number 11, and then at the end of verse 11, they made an appointment together to come, to come. I think that's a significant point, a thought here, a model example of what we are to do when our friend goes through some personal struggles in life, and that is just simply to be there. there there's something special about the, the ministry of presence And it's really important for a pastor that when somebody's going through a trial that a pastor shows up and says, you know what, we're just, we're here. We are here with you in the midst of a difficult time in your life. We are here. And uh, and so when Job was struck with this this difficulty, these three friends, they were from great distances They heard about his adversity that had come upon him, and they simply dropped everything that they were doing, made an appointment to come be near their 
friend. I mean, they came to him. They dropped everything and came to where he was. And I think there's a great point here, and that is when people are suffering, you should go, you should go to be with them. I, uh, Rudy Giuliani, this is a long time ago, I read one of his books. I just remember this chapter in, in one of his books. This was just after 9-11, after he wrote a book. And one of his chapters was this, weddings are discretionary, funerals are mandatory. I thought, well, that's, that's saying something. In other words, I need to be there when people are going through hardship and difficulty. There's something just about, hey, if somebody's going through it, they're not going to go through it alone and be isolated. In fact, Job encountered some of that. In fact, Job 19.14, it says this, that some didn't even go with him. It says, my relatives have failed and my close friends have forgotten me. That's how he felt during the midst of that struggle of being alone, being isolated. And I think that that's a major temptation for people is that when you hear of somebody's ad- adversity, that the, the common thing would be to do is to stay away. A lot of times we stay away from that situation because, first of all, we don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And so it would be easier for me just to not go there or put myself in an uncomfortable situation. Uh, But folks, let's, we've got to be very careful of that. Somebody could be dying of cancer, maybe a loss of a child, or maybe a a close friend that's gone through a divorce and, and, and neighbors and friends kind of stop visiting them because they don't know what to say and what happens is it leaves them and it leaves them more isolated uh, than what they actually are. One of the things that suffering does is that it cuts it, it cuts us off from other human beings. And so the ministry of presence, the ministry of just showing up, the ministry of just being there in the midst of people's suffering is so vital. It's so important. And I will tell you this, you'll find out who your real friends are in the midst of suffering. Come on, somebody. You'll find out who your real friends are. When you're facing personal struggle and personal challenges and personal difficulties, people that maybe perhaps claim that they were friends, but when, when the rubber meets the road and when you're at a moment of crisis in life and they're not there, you, find, you tend to find out who your real friends are in times of trouble. And notice this, he didn't summon them. He didn't call them. In fact, I don't know how they communicated back then because they were at great distances from each other. And there had to be some time frame that was in there before they actually came to that moment in his life. So he didn't summon them. He didn't call them on the phone or send them smoke signals or however they communicated back then. Get on a horse and and send uh, uh, one of those uh, pony express to them. You know what? It says that when they heard about it, they went. And so I just want to encourage you, when you hear about somebody's, don't be afraid to call them on the phone. Don't be afraid to stop by their house. Don't be afraid to show up. You know what? Your presence there may just help them in the midst of difficulty. I think a couple of illustrations, uh, biblical illustrations, are, are the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you know the story of the, the, uh, the, uh, the man that was beat up and left for dead, and he was at a moment of crisis in his life beaten and bloodied and left there to die. It says that the priest saw it and walked around it, and then one of the Levites saw it and walked on the other side of it. But then there was a good Samaritan. Notice the terminology Jesus uses in Luke chapter 10, verse number 31. It says there in verse number 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, listen, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went 
to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, which one of those was his friend? Was it the Levite? Was it the priest? No, it was the good Samaritan that came to where he was. Folks, we are called to go to those who are afflicted in this world. It's almost like police officers. We don't run from danger. We run to the danger. And that's what God has called us to be. If we want to encourage somebody, you got to be near. you got to be near them. Another biblical illustration is Jesus. Even himself went through very hardship, tough time in his life, struggle and sorrow. The Bible says that in the Garden of Gethsemane, there Jesus was greatly distressed. In fact, it was even to a point to where he wept or sweat drops of, like drops of blood. It was so intense, and he was very distressed over the situation. But I want you to notice, even Jesus himself wanted his friends close. Look at this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 36. It says that Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane, the place of crushing, and said to his disciples, hey, sit here while I go over and pray there. And it says he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful, deeply distressed, and he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you. Do you see that? Even Jesus needed somebody in his deepest, darkest hour. He said, Guys, come watch with me. Come pray with me. Sit here while I go over there. You know what? Sometimes you have to walk alone in that. But it's very comforting to know that you have access to somebody at any moment. That you could just reach out to them and say, hey, could you pray for me? Hey, would you help me? Hey, and you have accessibility to that. I think that that's so key, folks. And you know what? It's not even that you have to say something significant or profound. It could be as simple as this. Hey, I want you to know that I'm here. Anytime you need me, you give me a call. I'm right here. And that's comforting to people. I'm here. Aren't you thankful today that God came to us in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our difficulty? When we were alone, abandoned and bruised, God left the glories of heaven. He left this grand place, streets of gold. He left it and came to this sin-filled, sick world. He, he came to us. Folks, we do not serve a God that is afar off. We serve a God that's right here. He's with us. And folks, when everybody else leaves us, when everybody else abandons us, even family, friends, uh, when they leave us, guess what? God never leaves us, and he never forsakes us. That's the ministry of presence. That's the ministry of that God is here, that God is with you. Friend, you may be going through some hardship, and you may feel like, you know what, everybody's abandoned me, and everybody's left me, but I want you to know that God says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. I am near. I am here. Just call upon me at any time. I am here, and I am with you. That's him. Jesus said, I'm near you. Wow. Going to them being near. I want you to notice this about them. They came together. When they came, they came together. There were three amigos, right? There were three of them, and they had three friends, and they all just came together. I don't, people need a support group while they're going through some difficulty. And the church 
can be a great support group for people while they're going through some difficulty. The family can be a great support group for people while they're going through great difficulty. My friend, do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, can you imagine the pain and the sorrow she was experiencing and witnessing her one, her son, there beaten and bloodied, Uh, He didn't deserve that. Can you imagine the pain and the heartache that she was experiencing and seeing her innocent son being brutally crucified? Wow, what do you do when you're going through that? There's the scripture verse says, there at the foot of the cross, Mary was surrounded and he was surround, she was surrounded by some people that we don't even know. There was, she was surrounded by, it says, uh, Mary, another Mary, Mary Magdalene. She was sur- surrounded by Mary, the wife of, of Clopas, it says. And she was surrounded by John, the beloved. And she was surrounded by, I can't think of who the other person was. But, wow, in the midst of her suffering... She is surrounded by a group of people. They came together. Mary, Mary, the one that Jesus influenced, had eight demons or however many demons and brought deliverance. She was there with the mother of Mary. Mary, the wife wife of Clopas. Clopas was a man who had already died. So in other words, Mary, the other Mary was somebody who had been there, done that, and lost their spouse, right? Some of you can be a source of encouragement to somebody because you've been through some trials yourself. You've been through some difficulties. You got the t-shirt. You survived, and you can be a source of hope to them. Amen? And then we have John, John, who was probably the beloved, Jesus on the cross said, John, you're, behold your mother, behold your son. And that represents really the believers. It represents the church. The church needs to be there in people's lives, right? What are you saying? They came together. They came together as a support group. We need a support group. Not only did they come together, but notice the distance. They came at great distances, The scripture there emphasizes where they came from. Some of those places where it mentions there's only one, I think it was the first guy. And it was the place of where it was, I can't remember where it was. It was a team, but some of the studies I said was was it means a place of wisdom, meaning that it's wise that we come together and support. But they came at great distances. I mean, they kind of gave up a lot. They, I mean, they, they kind of had to, to come a distance. And this, is, this would be representative of, you know, I may have to get on a plane. You know, and I may have to uh, schedule a trip to San Francisco. I don't know what it is. But that's the distance that they had. They traveled great distance. Not only did they travel when they came, they, they came tra- great distances. But they also came... It says they made an appointment. When they came, they set aside their agenda. They had to let go of some things. And they had to schedule this in. There are some things that just pop up that are on the schedule, right? And we've got to make room and create margin in our lives for those and allow God, hey, you know what? I'll make that up sometime. This is more important. Sometimes, you know, they saw the great sorrow. They knew that this was important, and so they said, this isn't important for us to be there. So I need to move. They were, first of all, be near. I promise you these next two points are not that long. The second one is shed a tear. If you look in in, uh, verse number 11, the latter part of 11, it says, For they had made an appointment together to come, and for the reason of what? Verse number 11, to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. To mourn and to comfort him. And when they had raised their eyes from afar, they did not recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe 
and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. That's funny. What I want you to note here is that they began to shed a tear. Verse 11b says why they came. It says they came to mourn with him. They didn't come to hurt him. They didn't come to accuse him. And notice when they didn't, when they saw him from a distance, this thing had so affected Job and it affected his appearance. You see that with some people, right? That they go through some difficulty, some hardship, and it really affects them. Perhaps they don't have an appetite. They don't eat like they used to. In Job's case, he had boils and he had to scrape some of the the pus with, with broken pottery. <laughs> I mean, he probably had kept unkept. He, when people are going through this, they kind of lose track of keeping themselves up, right? They kind of don't have this motive to go take a shower, to, to clean up and to make yourself presentable. They, kept, they, they, keep, they don't keep themselves. And so that's what happened to Job. And so notice what, when they go there, they don't say, come on, come on, get over here. Let's shake yourself off. No, let's wipe this off here. Let's get, let's get dressed. They didn't, they didn't do that. They could have very easily have done that, right? And they could have said, you know, you really don't look like yourself. says they went there and they saw him and they, they, they cried. They cried. Wow. You know what? A shared burden is a lighter burden. It doesn't necessarily relieve the burden, but it certainly lightens the burden. Somebody comes along and shoulders the responsibility with you, shares in this, and that's exactly what these guys did. I mean, they came, they lifted up their eyes and their voices, and they exhibited these signs of genuine grief and anguish. Notice what they did. They tore their robes. They tore their robes and they sprinkled dust or ash. Do you remember last week we talked about Job? And you know that he did the same thing? Those were outward signs of an inward hurt. His heart was broken. His heart was torn And so he tore his clothes. That was a sign of grief in those days. And then the ashes symbolizes, some say that this was, he was in an ash heap or he was in the garbage dump outside of where he was from. That's how miserable he was. And guess what those guys did? They did the same thing. They went there and they tore their clothes. They ripped their robes as a sign of our hearts are broken with you. And they even, ashes, commiserating their pain, joining in him, in their sorrow. And folks, that's what God has called us to do, isn't it? In Romans, he tells us that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and we are to weep with those who weep. And that's what these, these three guys did. And that's what your friends need when they're going through some personal struggle. You know, just get in there with them. And, 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 and I mean, I don't, you don't have to tear your clothes. <laughs> Heaven forbid, keep your clothes on. It might scare them. But the concept is, is I'm going to have a broken heart with you. My heart is broken just as your heart is broken. And I'm going to share that suffering. I'm going to share it 
with you. I mean, these guys joined him in their sorrow. They identified with what he was going through. And they willingly lowered themselves to where he was. And they were putting themselves in his shoes. Do you know what that means? That Job is no longer crying alone. That these three men are crying with him. You know, Jesus did this. When his good friend Lazarus had died in John chapter 11, and Jesus went to the gravesite, and there his good friends, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, Lazarus had been in the tomb, and Jesus came, and the scripture here says in John 11, verse 33, he said, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, the shortest verse in this scriptures. You guys know what it is? What is it? Jesus wept. When he saw the pain of Mary and he saw the pain of Martha and the thought and the intent of losing Lazarus, a dear friend of his, it affected him. He joined in their sorrow. Jesus wept. You know, Jesus is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He sympathizes with us in the midst of our tragedies and difficulties and and he has emotion, and he, his emotion is, is that when we hurt, he hurts too. He joins us in our pain. And I think what we have to understand in, is this too, is in this scripture, it says that they sat with him for seven days and seven nights. Sometimes you have to give people space and time in the midst of their grief and loss and let them go through this process of sorrow I haven't done much study on it but I've heard that even in the biblical times that they would give you 40 days of sorrowing now I'm not saying that that's a specific number but 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 I'm saying people need space and people need time to go through their process of Shock and grief and pain and hurt and, and, and new way of life and living. It, it, it doesn't happen in one night, right? It happens through a series. Sometimes it can happen in months and sometimes it can take years. Years of that. And so, sometimes we just have to cry with people. Notice they came and they cried. Wonderful examples, these things of what we can do to help people in the midst of their suffering. But then thirdly, lastly, and that is to just hear. Be near, shed a tear, and then just hear. Look at verse number 13. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief was very great. Often the best response to a person's suffering is silence. Nothing needs to be said. You don't need to fix it with your words. The pain is too deep to be healed with mere words. I know even as a pastor, oftentimes we're looking to share something to bring hope, encouragement to the people. And often we want to say something spiritual and insightful. But I think what people need the most is just your presence. 
They don't need to be told, hey, the reason why you're suffering is this. I mean, the moment Job's friends opened up their mouth is the moment they went wrong. (laughs) Right? So if you're reading the Bible with us through our chronological plan, you have just stomached through six responses of these three friends, all trying to explain to him the reason why he's suffering. Come on, somebody. The moment that they opened up their mouth is the moment they went wrong and had a wrong response to somebody in their suffering. Heidi, why don't you go ahead and come to the piano? I mean, you've heard this before, I'm sure, that the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth is so that we can listen more and speak less. In James 1.19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Do you see that? Swift to hear, I'm going to listen to you. Slow to give my opinion, and then slow to wrath. You ever listen to somebody and you think, oh, I'm already devising the game plan. Here's the solution to it. And then perhaps, you know what? In other words, if I hear their side of the story a little bit, let me hear their side of the story, and then I don't have to share my... I think our world needs that right now, don't you? (laughs) I won't, I won't get as angry if I'm listening and attune, attune more to you and to your needs, and then I'm going to kind of withhold my thought and my opinion of it. It's going to lead to less anger in my life. In fact, if you would read some of the accounts of these guys, these three friends, they were some angry dudes. They were some angry, it says there in some of the responses, They were angry. Why? Because they got to get their side of the story in. They got to tell tell their side of the story. And so we see here, I'll just end with this this morning. And, you know, we had this tragic event in our Clinton Central community and very, very difficult. A lot of people, a lot of people hurt. A lot of people hurt, and some that I know very well. Heidi and I went to the viewing, and out as we were walking in, somebody was walking out that, that experienced a very similar tragedy. And we just came face to face with them. And I know that they were hurting because it triggers same emotion and pain. You know what I'm saying? Same emotion and pain. And, and this has probably been nine, ten years ago this has happened. I don't know what it is, but something can trigger something in the past. You know what I'm saying? You think, oh, I'm over that. I'm done with that. I haven't... I, I, and then, then something comes up and reminds you of it, and it creates those old feel, feelings again, right? It triggers that. And, and we w- came face to face with them. And I could tell that they had tears in their eyes as they were coming out. And I went right up to her, Mama, and I said, let me give you a hug. And I gave her a hug. And I gave the, the dad a hug that was there. And, you know, they were, they were crying. And I just said, guys, I don't have any words to say to you. I don't. But I just want you to know that we're here praying for you. We're here lifting you up in prayer. And we went inside and they left. Folks, you don't need to have a theological reason as to why I'm encountering personal suffering in my life. They'll eventually find that out. God will show them if they need it, if, if they need to be shown that. 
And what you just need to do is have listening ears to hear what they're saying. So if people are experiencing struggles of some sort, you know, because people are going to say things that will hurt people in the midst of their soft suffering. They're going to say things that are well-intentioned. They, they're well-intentioned people, and they are trying to help, and they're trying to help with the situation. But we, we got to be very careful. Job's friends became Job's accusers. Right? And began to accuse him of something that he didn't do. And they said it six times. And Job said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Sometimes you just got to not listen to what people say. And sometimes you just have to let it ducks, water off a duck's back. You just have to let it go. And not receive it and not accept it. And come with the thought that these are people that are, have in good intentions, but it's not said very well. I don't know about you, but I've been Job's friend several times probably. I know when I go into a hospital room or I go into some place and sometimes I'll start to share something. And, you know, perhaps sometimes the best thing to do is just listen. You know what, I think I have found this to be true and a lot of the, the counseling stuff that I've taken, training, and et cetera, stuff like that. It says this, if you let people talk, they begin to discover what the solution is. In other words, they begin to talk it out. And they think, well, here's this answer to this. So, when you're going through, I think, wise counsel says, Let's just listen. And I'm thankful today that God has ears, don't you? That he listens to my cares. He hears my cries. And when I'm suffering, God hears me when I call out to him today. How do we support others? How can I be a good friend on a bad day? Like this initial response or example of Job's three friends, I can be number one, be near. I can come to where they are. Number two is I can shed a tear. I can cry with them. I can mourn with them. I can join them in the midst of their sorrow, putting on, tearing my robes and ashes. And I can just hear. I can sit and I can listen. I can listen to people. And I think that when we do those things, people, when they go through a struggle, you'll be able to help them in their time of need.